Hello, everybody. Welcome to Tunnel Vision, an episode of Tunnel Vision is beginning right now. We are live on Facebook Hello, Live, everybody. and Welcome someone has the volume up over here. Uh, we're live on Facebook and we're live on Periscope right now. We are fixing YouTube. So sorry, everybody, about YouTube. Uh, I am joined alongside Ryan Abraham and Shotgun Spratling, and I'm your host, Keely Orr. Today, we're going to be talking about, of course, JT Daniels. We haven't talked about him being named starter since uh, last Thursday. We didn't get a chance to. Uh, we're going to be talking about the depth chart that came out on Sunday. We're going to talk about the transfers. Where there's now two transfers that happened between last episode and today. And, of course, we're going to preview the UNLV game. There's actual football happening, guys, on Saturday. Football. What? That's pretty exciting. And then we're going to answer your questions. So we have a lot. It's a packed show today. <laughs> packed show. Packed show. But the, we went through a whole week of open practice. There will be a closed practice today. What did you guys see uh, from this week in this, uh, these two practices? A little different out there now. So they did some scout team work. It's uh, the JT Daniels show. Uh, we didn't see as much Jack Sears. You got some some Matt Fink in there. I uh, got to see a lot of the players on defense and you know who's going on over to the scout team, who's working with the first and second teams. So it's uh, it's definitely more of a game week. I think this was probably important to let you know because JT Daniels hasn't been on campus all that long. Give him a regular week of, of game week. If they were still competing this week. I don't know how much sense uh, that would have made. So uh, I thought it was good. We'll see. Uh, you know, it's now his show. We got to talk to him on Tuesday uh, for a little while. They kind of limited how much he was going to say. But um, I kind of front and center show there. He just seemed like very measured, very calm. He's talked about controlling his breathing as they're going to walk into the Coliseum. So he's uh, he's the guy right now. JT Daniels the guy. We didn't, maybe didn't expect it Sunday night when they released the depth chart actually before that. Uh, but they did, so no cutting it down to two, nothing like that. JT Daniels is the guy. JT's the guy. You know, he got all the work this week as far as with the ones. Uh, one of the things with the scout team is they did some different things than we've seen in the past as far as scout team work. They, you know, it wasn't these longer periods that we've sure. seen with scout team. You would see during special teams, a small groups would go off and do a little bit of scout team work on other things. Uh, so they actually did some scout team work before we were even allowed into uh, practice, before they do their stretching and stuff, where there was normally a, okay, let's run our plays type of, of period. They turned that into scout team work uh, in the beginning. And then they took those periods where they would have been doing scout team and kept those competitive periods. Yeah. Uh, so we saw a little bit different uh, way to go about it this week, and we'll see you know, how that you know, how that's evolves throughout the season. And you know if they get some guys banged up, do they cut back and, and different things like that. But we're still seeing some competition, which is good. Uh, it's good to see those guys still going at each other. And, and you know, there's still guys battling for some positions. Uh, you know, we got Bo Bowen was named the starter at the safety spot. Uh, you know, yesterday we actually found out that Greg Johnson will be starting at the other cornerback spot opposite of Iman Marshall. They, he had been you know listed as or with well, Isaiah yeah. Langley, but yesterday Clancy Pendergast said he would be the one getting the start. So still some battles out there, and obviously Clancy wants to rotate more this year. He feels like he has more depth. He said that you know they went through their mock game week and. You know, they, they had a walkthrough in the hotel, and it was kind of a, you know, clap it up type of thing. He said it was standing room only, basically, in the hotel, <laughs> uh, whereas normally people, yeah. normally <laughs> they would have a bunch more space. So he said you can definitely see the difference there. And, and, you know, I think that he is trusting some of those other guys, so we'll see how much they rotate, especially against UNLV if they can get up like we kind of expect that they can. Then, you know, how many of those guys on the roster actually get, in, get some playing time? Cool. So we actually have uh, – so Facebook's up. And Periscope's up, so if you have any comments in those on monitoring Periscope, we should be able to put the Facebook comments up on live on the screen if you have any questions like that. I don't think YouTube's up, right? No, I don't think so. Okay. Sorry about that. So we're broadcasting on two different platforms. We'll make sure we'll get the third one. Our trimalcast is only a simulcast. It's a, yeah, it's a simulcast, not a trimalcast. But, um, so sorry for the YouTubers. We'll put it up on YouTube afterwards. You'll be able to see it. Um, so sorry about that. Uh, we mentioned the depth chart. Shaka mentioned it. Were there any surprises to you guys about uh, when the depth chart was released? Ja I mean, Jack Sears not being the number two quarterback was a bit of a surprise to me. I wouldn't say there's you know a ton of huge surprises. Um, you know, you get Austin Jackson getting the start over Clayton Bradley, uh, but who knows if Austin Jackson will be healthy and Clayton Bradley will start anyway. But um, I think the Jack Sears thing, and and they they addressed this uh, during the week. I think it was Brian Ellis talked about it. I think Shaka, you were you were talking to him and mentioned stuff that you don't necessarily see out on the practice field. And if you followed us along on uscfootball.com, I charted every competitive throw 
Jack Sears was well ahead of what Matt Fink was as far as completion percentage. Uh, he was just much more efficient. And just watching him, he looked like the better option at quarterback, Jack Sears, over Matt Fink. And I think Brian Ellis knew that. I think people realized that that's the talk was, that he was by far he was the better of the two quarterbacks. But they said, you know, it's not everything you see on the practice field. There's stuff that goes on in the meeting rooms and things like that. So, you know, I... I think that there's some legitimate, you know, I think that's legitimate concerns. I don't know. We'll see. I mean, how that, if there was any kind of ulterior motives or anything like that, why you would put Matt Fink over Jack Sears. But to me, that was the one. Jack Sears seemed to me like the better quarterback. And I'm not convinced if JT Daniels went down with a knee injury, you know, whatever, uh, on, you know, the opening drive, do you put Jack Sears in the game or the next game? I, I think. Long term, they would probably go with Jack Sears over Matt Fink. Is my guess. What Brian L says that as far as managing the offense, that's where Matt Fink had the advantage. So uh, that's what he was talking about. As far I think, just as far as grasping the concepts and stuff and being able to run the offense in that regard, I think that's what they were referring to. Uh, you know, he talked a little bit last week when we talked to him about Jack Sears. He said, you know, there's some things in the, the playbook he basically still has to learn. So uh, I think that's part of it. And like you said, I think if, if JT were to go down with an injury, I think Jack Sears would be in sooner rather than later. Yeah. So, I mean, people are asking already in the questions about will Fink or Jack Sears transfer. I mean, Matt Fink said that he's a Trojan for life, which kind of gives you the, the hint maybe he's staying. As far as Jack Sears, though, if he looks like a guy who's more likely to transfer, do you kind of – push him out the door a little bit by putting him third string on the depth chart? Yeah, that's, I mean, that could be one of the, the reasons why people were speculating, oh, they're going to wait this long so he doesn't transfer. And then it's like they're speculating, well, they put him third so we would transfer. I mean, I don't know. If, if he came to the coaches and said, hey, if I don't win the job, I'm going to transfer, there's no reason to, to put him above Matt Fink. Yeah. So maybe something like that was going on. I don't think it's anything that the coach, unless he said that, um, I couldn't see another reason why you'd put him third if you really felt he was second. Now, you take the coaches at their word. If they feel he's third and, and think is second, that's fine. But if, if Sears did come to them, then there's no reason to put him uh, in there. So we'll see if they put some packages, like we talked about this on other shows, that you know if, it, if they do something at the goal line or they want a running quarterback and they could put Fink or, Fink or Sears in, I thought Sears would probably be the guy they put in. But in this case, I don't know. Maybe they still could even though he's not technically second on the depth chart. I mean, I don't think they're putting him third to push him out. I don't think yeah. they, that's something they want to do. Uh, so they would, obviously for USC, the best case scenario is that he at least stays for this year because you never want to have just two scholarship quarterbacks because if you have, you know, if you have the rash of injuries like Maryland had a few years ago when they got down to the fourth or fifth string, they had to move a linebacker over type of thing. Like, you don't want that to happen. No. Um, so... <laughs> so Position, Obviously. position players pitching like you know, yeah you know, exactly you know. like you don't that's a rare occasion that, you, <laughs> that usually means bad things and that would be the same thing for you as a baseball reference I know <laughs> uh, but with Jack <laughs> with Jack Sears you know they don't want to push him out the door they would love to have him especially or at least until next year when they have you know uh, at least one quarterback committed right now and they're you know, possibly bringing in two quarterbacks in this class. So, and the 2020 class, obviously, you know, it'll be Bryce Young already committed. So they would lo love to have at least three quarterbacks on the roster at all times. You don't want to get down below that. So I don't think they're trying to push him out by putting him through. Yeah, and there's another quarterback out there now, number 13, who'd been an oft-injured guy that's kind of made the rounds a little bit. Uh, what was, it? was it Brandon Purdue? Is that yeah. his name? Yeah, Brandon Purdue. So we kind of learned about him. He's been running... The scout team, bigger kid, strong arm, you know, strong arm. So I think maybe you bring in someone like that if you do feel one of those guys. So we don't know what's going to happen. Um, you know, does it mean something they put Jack Sears third and he intends to transfer? I mean, who knows at this point. But uh, as of now, the three of them are on there and doing their jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as transfers go, we did, uh, Helton did confirm that Achilles Ross is transferring. Uh, he's going to finish his a uh, degree in fall and then be a graduate transfer in 2019. And also uh, fellow DB Jakari Godfrey is also transferring. Uh, was Jakari's transfer a little surprising to you guys? Kind of came out of the blue, but he's really not been, he's kind of been buried on the depth chart, right? He hasn't really been getting the reps. And even his whole recruitment was kind of weird. Like he was a late ad. He took an official visit, um, you know, late in, you know, mid or late January or mm -hmm. something. 
after he was injured. So he was like in a, like, I think he might have been on crutches. Like he had hurt his knee or something like that in high school. So it was this thing where he wasn't really being recruited all that hard. And, and like USC kind of brings him in late and takes them. So it was a weird, Gerard would know more about the ins and outs of that, but the, his whole recruiting process was a little bit strange. And then you just never really heard a ton uh, from him while at USC. So it's not like, super surprising that he wasn't going to stick around, but just the way it happened, like on the Achille Ak Ross day, he's <laughs> transferring out too. So you lose two DBs in one day. Yeah, we saw he, he didn't participate in, you know, uh, the last practice that we saw on Thursday or Wednesday, excuse me. Uh, so he was on my list of guys to ask about, especially because didn't see him on that day. So, was, you know, like Austin Appleby disappeared for like five days. I was like, what happened to Austin Appleby? Well, he had mono, so that's why he wasn't around. Sure, yeah. So I expected it might be something like that. No, 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 he's transferring out. So yeah. we found out real quick, you know, that he was gone uh, on that day. With, with that, the thing is, it's not a big issue for USC because they have talented cornerbacks in front of yeah. him. And that's part of the reason, you know, that he probably made this decision is that, you know, when you bring in Elijah Griffin and Isaac Taylor Stewart, those are two very highly rated guys. And those guys had already kind of pushed themselves potentially in front of him, you know, if you go into the game week. Um, so he's kind of getting buried there. However, the, the question and the concern becomes next year, actually, because USC loses Iman Marshall, loses Jenna Harris, Lose Isaiah Langley. You have the safety position. Now you've lost Achille Ross. You lose Jonathan Lockett at nickel. Uh, you, you know you're losing a bunt. You're losing Marvell Tell at the safety spot, obviously. So you're, you know, one of the things they talked about in fall camp this year is like, wow, there's a lot more bodies, you know, sure. at that, you know, in the defensive secondary. Um, so it's going to go from okay, we we spread it back out. You know, we brought in you know four guys and then the three cornerbacks and one safety. So made that group a lot bigger because they didn't really lose anybody last year besides Chris Hawkins, and now it goes back to this next year. Yeah. So how are they going to recruit to fill in for some of those bodies that they're losing there? And, you know, can you bring in quality recruits instead of, you know, late in the cycle guys where you uh, you end up guys that don't end up playing and now they have to now they decide to transfer it? Yeah, Godfrey, was he a cow? Was he going to Cal or something? He was committed to Cal. Yeah. Uh, he had a bad knee injury, um, so he didn't play the end of his – senior season, right. so he was kind of a project in that regard. Great size, which is what USC really liked about him from Bishop O'Dowd, same high school as Elijah Vera Tucker. Um, I saw him play when, when USC played uh, at Stanford that year. I went okay. up and watched Elijah Vera Tucker, um, and you know he caught my eye. You know, I, you know, I always try to get pictures of any of the guys we have in the system just for the other sites to use as well. So I was watching him a little bit, and you know he looked solid. Um, but you didn't really expect anything of it because USC wasn't recruiting him at all. But he has the you know the qualities they've been looking for in defensive backs, and you know the size, the length. Uh, but coming off the knee injury, that was the big concern. So you knew he was basically going to redshirt last year, and you know just, just hasn't taken that next step forward, I guess. And that's probably why he was moving down the depth chart rather than moving up. Yeah. Uh, just a reminder to get your questions, and we will address those pretty soon. Uh, before we get to that, one last question for you guys. The UNLV game, obviously it's not the, the toughest opponent for USC. What would you guys consider a successful season opener for the Trojans? You know, the spread's 26, 26 and a half points. Um, and, you know, I, I think I've been on the – I don't see USC covering a lot of big spreads. We'll see. I mean, that might change this year, but they didn't do very well last year. They're uh, – I think they're 0-5 against – um, you know, in their like out of conference last, you know, last four, five out of conferences against the spread. We'll see. I think you have a, a big like Cam Newton, Vince Young type of quarterback or Armani Rogers is a true sophomore from out here in Hamilton High School. You know, I think he could pose a problem. They got a veteran. Uh, was it Lexington? I think is the Good uh, name. Yeah, Lexington Thomas, uh, the running back uh, short, like five, seven ish kind of dude. But he's a senior. I think their offense is pretty good. If you look at the the projections, they're probably middle of the like of not power five, but middle of like uh, FBS. Uh, defensively, they were pretty bad last year, so we'll see kind of what they do. But I kind of feel like USC is just going to, it's like kicking the tires. They're, they're not going to go out and try to score fifty points, is is my guess. And this UNLV team has gotten better every year, uh, Tony Sanchez. So I kind of think they win by like three touchdowns sort of thing, and I think that'd be fine. Like I don't think fans should get all upset about it, but that kind of thing. That would be successful. USC team. has been terrible at covering the spread over yes. the last five years, if not longer. Um, basically, since Pete Carroll left, they've been, just been terrible covering the spread. Like, the games that they're supposed to win by 30, they win by 25. Right. Uh, the, the games they're supposed to win by 8, they win by 6, or they lose. You know, So, a lot of things... Uh, 
as far as the gambling and people continue to put money on USC to beat the spread, uh, which is why the spreads stay up higher yeah. <laughs> with USC for whatever reason. However, I think they cover the spread. Oh, okay. I think that this team, so I think not, the you defense. Don't learn. You don't learn then. Yeah, I don't learn. Uh, <laughs> it's your quarterback, though. The thing is, it's a running offense against this defense. I think as long as they tackle, they don't have a Washington, I mean, a Western Michigan game like they did last year where they missed a ton of tackles yeah. in that game in the first uh, opener. I think the physicality that they tried to impart this season during fall camp will help with that. I think they, you know, they tackle a lot better later in camp as far as the, you know, the live periods that we saw. So I think that they'll they'll take care of that regard, and I don't that offense doesn't scare me. I know they can run the ball, but I think with the veterans that you have on USC's defense, that run, just being a one-dimensional run offense, because I don't think Armani Rogers is really good through the air, um, then I think the defense shuts them down, and the offense will score 28 points. We'll see. Big big scary quarterback. I don't know. I kind of think they might keep it close. Big scary. For a while. It's not Vince Young or Cam Newton. I mean, he's he's big and scary, and the fact he's physical, but. Yeah. It's well, not the same. Those guys could actually throw a little bit. Yeah. Ooh, Sean, I'm getting testy already. Um, let's actually start questions now. Let's go to a question from Tarek who says, oh. how is JT Daniels different from Sam Darnold and Cody Kessler? How is he different? With different parents? Like there's a whole <laughs> lot of things. You know, no. he, his <laughs> mind is what the coaches point out more than anything yeah. else. Brian Ellis said when they brought him on his recruiting trip, he said that basically when they're recruiting any quarterback, they put him on the board. Which means they tell them, "Hey, go drop your favorite play. You know, uh, what's uh, you know, what's this protection? What's this? Because a lot, and he said, because a lot of uh, kids are in these spread offenses where it's very simple reads and stuff. It's bubble screens and different things. Well, they want to see what their knowledge is of you. You know, more of a pro style offense like USC runs. And he said, immediately, JT was yeah. you know right there. And he like was calling his own plays at modern day as a yeah. sophomore. You know, it's like that's insane. So and not just calling his own plays, like literally just. <laughs> calling certain routes on one side, calling dummy routes like it was. When I saw it, I was I was super impressed by it. And then, um, and then the physical attributes have gotten better and better each year. You you've gotten more arm strength since you know I saw him. Uh, the only time I saw him play in a game was as a sophomore. Obviously, we've seen him in uh, seven on seven and different things. But as a sophomore, from then you've seen better arm strength. He's gotten thicker as well, which all obviously helps with that. Ryan Helinski also another quarterback who added some weight and helped with the arm strength. But he added the mobility. Remember yeah. when he committed last summer? Everybody, oh my God, why is USC taking a statue in the yeah. pocket? And then first game, Keeley goes and watches him and runs for, I think, two touchdowns, including you know, yeah. one over 50 yards. Yeah, so he, he, he heard those things, yeah. and he took it to heart and went and uh, you know, improved himself. So I think he has some different attributes, but the biggest thing is the mind. He, you know, he can read defenses, and, and he makes quick decisions. That was one of the other things that the coaches talked about as far as him winning the job was his decision-making. Now, once he gets in the game, might be a little bit different. We'll see how it goes right. when all the lights are on and everything else. So uh, we'll see as far as game time, but I don't think there's going to be that much regression from what we've seen in practice. No, and I think Sam Darnold, he's like gunslinger kind of guy. He has that mentality. He's going to make hero plays all over the place. And not that JT Daniels can't do that. You're probably not going to expect him to do that this first year. Cody Kessler was more of a game manager kind of guy. He wasn't taking a lot of the big risks. He was dumping it off. He was taking what you know what the defense gave him, and you know was a little more conservative as far as a quarterback. I think there's kind of a, a middle ground with JT Daniels, but he can be kind of like a surgeon. He's there's the way he's going to approach this game. So very, they're all. I think they're all different quarterbacks. I think arm talent wise. JT Daniels is, you know, above what you would see from like a Cody Kessler and stuff like that, and as smart as any of those guys. So like what Shotgun's saying. So it, they're all they're all pretty different. But I, I'm curious to see if JT Daniels does start to get to that gunslinger mentality a little bit at some point. Maybe later on the season. There's probably going to be games where they're going to ask him to, hey, we need to go. You got to make something happen. You know, Sam Darnold would do that all the time. I don't think they would like JT Daniels to do that. But if the offense struggles early. He might be expected to. And then you got to ask a guy who's making a second or third start to go out and win games for you, which that's a lot. Yeah, and you know, that tough schedule they have coming up in September after the UNLV game, uh, we'll, we'll definitely see what he can do there. Uh, I think that as his confidence grows, you may see him become more of a gunslinger and, you know, feel that instead of being, okay, well, I need to make this throw or whatever, and be like, I can make that throw. I can. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that I think it like is... The check down's open, but I'm on Rossi Brown's over yeah, time. Yeah, we'll try, try this out. <laughs> that guy catches pretty much everything. Let's try him. Uh, one of the things with, since you brought up Cody Kessler, that I think is similar to Cody Kessler, is I thought Cody Kessler really had a really good pocket awareness and could move around the pocket to create a little bit of extra time. Now, he wasn't going to take off and run for 
30 yards or 20 yards, picking up the first downs with his feet. However, he moved around enough that he was able to buy a little bit more time for plays. I think JT does that pretty well. Um, now, obviously, we only see so much in the scrimmages so far. Yeah. And at modern day, he was protected really well because of, you know, he had five D1 guys in front of him on that offensive line. The question came was the year before, as a junior or as a sophomore, at the end of the year, Bosco was able to really pressure them, and he he struggled in that game. So, you know, has he taken the next step in that? I think that's one of the things he worked on because of that game, and you know, losing to St. John Bosco, one of their Trinity League rivals, and he came back and he was better last year as far as not only the athleticism and being able to run with the ball out of the pocket, but also his pocket awareness and stuff. So I, I think that's one thing to watch, but I think it's similar to Cody Kessler in the regard. He's not Sam Darnold. He's not going to you know make guys miss in the open field, but he's going to create a little bit extra time. I always thought Cody Kessler would be more athletic coming to USC because he, you know, he was like dunking a basketball in eighth grade and stuff like that, but he just never really – I thought he'd be a guy that could just – if he had to, just take off and run more. He was pretty good, you know, getting out of the pocket, but we never really saw him. I think that was just his that. mindset, though. Yeah, I think it was the same I think thing. He, with he had it in him, though. But it just we never. Yeah. Really, I kind of expected more of that. But interesting. In the same uh, theme of JT Daniels, uh, Zach Schwartz says, "Is JT Daniels taking a leadership role now that he is QB one? Is he vocal? Is he communicating with his line and wide receivers? What kind of leadership will he provide?" I mean, I don't think you want an eighteen-year-old kid to be like. I mean, you want him to be a leader, but there's limitations of what you want it to be. I think you want the veterans on the team to be the leaders, you know. And it might you might turn to uh, Toa Lobendon or Aka Cedric Ware, like on the offensive side. You you got the guys on the defensive side too. Um, you know, we'll see. I think he's got to get his feet wet. I don't think you're gonna you know you respect him because he's a really good quarterback. But if he came in the first day and gave some kind of Tim Tebow speech about, it's like, <laughs> you're not going to really listen to that. I think, hey, kid, you just got here. Like, you're, we're going to follow you. But so I think he's a leader, but there's going to be limitations on that leadership. And then when he does hit a few passes to Amon Ross St. Brown over the top or, or make a player get away from a sack and keep a play alive to win a game at the end, I, then I think you start to build that up. It's just hard to expect someone to come in. Yes, he's the quarterback, but you, I don't think you want to get a speech from a guy that, you know, some the, the new guy in town, the guy just walks in, and he's really good, but he's telling you what to do right away. Like, okay, hold on, you know, pump the brakes a yeah, little bit. Yeah, Chuma Doga's not, go, not going, <laughs> yeah, what, what you said. No, now the question becomes, and we talked about this, Keely and I uh, in particular talked about this last year, there was no real offensive vocal leader. No. Yep. And that was an issue. Now I think as his confidence gains, the same thing with the, you know, the, what passes he may or may not throw early in the season versus late in the season. I think if his confidence grows, and obviously if he does well, you gain more respect when you do well. Uh, and then I think he is a guy that can be a vocal leader. I don't think he needs to be or will be at the beginning of the season, but as it progresses, I think it'll, you know, you'll start seeing that trajectory where he takes on that. And then the next year he's the captain for two years, that type of thing. Yeah, It's kind of like what we saw when uh, Sam Darnold took over for Max Brown. Sam had the talent where he was a leader in that sense, but not as vocal and the vocal progressed. Um, Sam never became super vocal, but it, it was kind of threading the needle of, hey, there's veteran guys who've been here and I'm now in, in the spotlight. I'm going to lead as much as I can, but not overbearing. And I think you can see in, in JT Daniels' uh, press conference on Tuesday, he's very self-aware. You know, he wasn't like, uh, I'm the best guy ever and I'm going to take the job. He was like, I'm no. still, I have a long way to go and I'm very honored, but I'm still, I haven't played a game yet. So I, he's definitely self-aware and I don't think he's going to be that guy to come and talk to Chuma and tell him what to do. <laughs> hey Chuma, here's what. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't That's that a good happening. example. Yeah. But I think he can be more of a vocal leader than Sam Darnold, yes, just by personality yeah. wise. I, I, I think Sam is still more of a surfer bro than, <laughs> than JT, where JT is ultra competitive. Um, he does. He, we haven't seen him like screaming at anybody or anything, but I think he has that competitiveness in him. Yeah, yeah. and if you couple that with Amon Ra St. Brown, I think those two are going to be. Amon Ra is the 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 one that will yell at someone or will go yeah. off. Yeah, he is. I can see him telling like Michael Pittman or Tyler Vaughn's like what they should be doing on a route or something. <laughs> Hey, kid. Well, Ultra competitive. Kid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's go to a question from Richard who says, Will Toa start on Saturday? Now, that is an interesting question because yeah. uh, Clay Holden was asked that on uh, Wednesday, and he said, We'll see, which is definitely not what we expected coming into the week. Helton did 
drop a few breadcrumbs. Last Thursday's uh, presser after a close practice, he told us that Toll Obendon did not practice, which if you're not playing a game on Saturday and it's a close practice and they'll be back on Tuesday, if it's not something super serious, Helton doesn't necessarily have to tell the media that Toll yeah. sat out. And the fact that he oh. was retroactive with... <laughs> What's the face? Tealy reading some tea leaves. I like it. She's like, oh, last Thursday he said this, and now I'm reading. It, it like, did. I, it yeah. raised an eyebrow for me because he mentioned that Toa had a pec injury from the summer, which we didn't really know about, and then he told us that he didn't play on Thursday. So it raised an eyebrow, and then now uh, he didn't. He didn't practice on Wednesday. Couldn't finish on Tuesday, uh, and that's important for your starting center if you're going to have a rookie quarterback. Start for the first time on Saturday. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing is the fact that you have a f true freshman quarterback. You would love to have that veteran in the front. Sure. Because the other option is, the ball, yeah. is redshirt freshman Brett Nealon. Yeah. And nothing against Nealon, but you would rather have a redshirt senior that can point out because your center is making all your calls. You'd rather have that than you know having to put more onus on the quarterback. So to take a little pressure off him, you really would love to have Toa there. Question mark, I think, is the best way yeah. just to, you know, we don't really know. Um, He's been snapping better, too. So that's the, there were some real snapping issues early. Maybe the it's first the day. First few days. It was like even at the. First two days. The scrimmage, even, there were some problems. Though. He's had one bad snap since the first two days, I think. Uh, there's been, that's, anyway. That's debatable, but yes. Yes. Shotgun. Two bad snaps. Sorry. Uh, He'll be fine a, as far as that goes. So that, no, but that's that's nice because that's an improvement. You know, we'll see with Brett Nealon or Neil. I like Nealon. It's Nealon. It's, I like Nealon. Nealon. It's Nealon. I know. That's what he said. Is uh, it Dietrich or Dedich? That's the real Dedich. question. Dedich, I believe, okay. yeah. I like Dedich, too. He's kind of a honorary, honorary offensive lineman. So, yeah, so you're going to have a rookie quarterback. You talk about covering the spread. You're going to have a <laughs> potential rookie center. You definitely have a rookie quarterback coach. So, I mean, I'm just not sure this is going to be like – if you're expecting fireworks because it's USC versus UNLV, I don't know. It could happen. I mean, obviously, there's way more talent on the USC side, but maybe not. We'll see. I mean, Dan brought up the, the theory that Toa didn't even snap that much in spring. He hasn't had that much of snapping happening in fall. Is it that big of a deal if you have Brett Nealon? That's what Dan said. Not necessarily yeah. my opinion. I think it's just more of the, you know, you, you'd rather have an experienced guy who started all left tackle and all that kind of stuff. I mean, someone, you know, you'd rather have that guy there. I would think. I can't name one person on the UNLV defense. Yeah, I don't think their defensive line is that good. If there's a game that you're going to have your starting center out, maybe it's this one, Gabe Well, the, the thing then becomes... Gabe McKay. He's an outside linebacker. <laughs> he's written down. Uh, down. <laughs> Thanks to Chris Trevino, you get five people to watch. I did some of the <laughs> offensive guys, but I'm like, the defensive guys? Exactly. That's my yeah. point. Like, there's nobody they're, on They were pretty defense. bad defensively. Last um, year. And the question becomes... Is it? In, do we need to get him in there? How healthy is he? Do we save him, get him ready for this stretch that's coming up? Obviously, much more important to have him there. Um, you would love to have him just because of the first game and all that stuff. But if you're looking at the big picture, maybe it's better to rest him and give him that extra week. I know a lot of people are claiming for that with Porter, but Porter looks like he's 147 percent, like <laughs> always. So yeah, he's back. We'll full see speed. if he. We talked about this at practice. Um, seeing him out there getting. You know, real reps. I, I think it's important to have him practice because last year it was just like they put him in the games and, you know, there was only a couple of times he would play. But the important thing is you have to, I think you, that's a great step is to let, allow him to practice. Like, need him out on the practice field. If he can't practice, don't need to put him in the game. But then, and, and Shotgun, you know, adamant about this, you got to keep him on the pitch count. They put him on a pitch count last year and they didn't follow it and that was just, that wasn't very smart. So, uh, I think you put him on a pitch count for UNLV. To practice this week is good. You're basically getting him ready for Stanford and Texas. Play him 15 plays or something. He gets hit. He's out there on the field, and he can walk off and, and be able to practice the next time you go out in the practice. That, that hasn't happened, right? So yeah. you do that, and then he should be a lot closer to being ready for Stanford. Yeah, the big deal with poor Gustin is that last year it was, okay, we'll throw him into the games, like you said. We don't know how his body is going to react to contact and stuff that we can limit in practice, which is, you know, what they were able to do if they wanted to this week. They saw, you know, he practiced full full pads, he goes into one-on-ones. He did some limited team work on, on uh, Tuesday. He was taken out of some, uh, some of the team stuff to get some of those younger guys opportunities as well. And he came back on Wednesday. That was the big thing. Is can he re how does the body react after that? Last year you didn't know because they had not practiced him at all, so he just threw him out there and game. Well, we'll see how it reacts afterwards. 
And then because the adrenaline's going or whatever, in ASU, we're going to hold him to 25 plays, and he goes 42, I think it was. It's like it made no sense at all. And then you lost him for the rest of the year. It was right. very bad management of an injury in that regard. And now, should he have come back for the Texas game? That's yeah. Right. If he was cleared, sure. I mean, they played really well when he was in the game. Yeah. Like so, but I but probably not. No, he probably didn't. Need, you know. I mean, if he's cleared, then as the coaching staff, you is he cleared? Medical staff? Yes. Okay. You feel okay? Okay. We'll throw you in there. Yeah. As a coach staff, I don't think you take blame for that. Now, if you say we're only going to play him 25 plays and you're playing 42, that's your fault. Yeah. Well, Clancy joked yesterday that uh, they are going to assign a specific equipment manager to hide Port Augustine's helmet at a certain point. So, <laughs> and that's what it takes. I guess that's what you got to do. Uh, let's go to a question from Tester Troy, who says, Ryan, it's specifically for Ryan, will oh, Chuma Adoga ever be healthy? Will be healthy. Yeah. Now he's gonna be all right. Like, <laughs> come on. Maybe not. But he. No. I think. I think he's got the NFL potential. He's gonna look at this year as an opportunity to take his game to another level. I think you're gonna see him out there whenever it's physically possible. Like you can't predict. You know, he gets banged up or whatever like that. But I think you're gonna see a more dedicated Chuma Adoga this year. Um, just kind of putting it on the table. He's. You know, he's got a different personality. He's a little bit quirky of a dude. Um, I don't think you're going to see some of the distractions that you saw maybe in some of the other stuff. So I, I, I kind of feel he's going to come out and play really well. And he's he has that potential to be drafted. We haven't seen a lot of USC guys go in the first round of the offensive line for quite a while. I'm not saying he's going to do that, but I think that's a goal of his. He'll try to get there. He was banged up last year and he was still their best lineman. Yeah, so. fair. That's fair, yeah. You would hope that he stays healthy because he has All-American potential. Can he stay healthy? I know yeah. he, he played through some stuff last year as well. I mean, I remember him saying that Mike Goff, you know, one of the assistant coaches, uh, was I think a graduate assistant last year, and that was an analyst. I don't know what exactly his title is, but right. he was a He's former right. former NFL lineman, and he told him, "Look, in the NFL, you basically you're hurt every week. And you play through <laughs> it. You find a way to play through it. You know, you got nicks and bruises and bangs, you know, throughout the entire season. It's when you have an injury versus, you know, yeah. when you're healthy." You're never you're healthy yeah. where you're hurt versus an injury. Yeah. So uh, I think he learned a little bit to play through stuff last year. And like I said, he still was their best lineman. So I think he'll, he'll be – they didn't want to rush him with some stuff early in camp. You know, he had the hip, sore hip um, or a labrum issue in his hip. So I think he'll be okay. I think he'll be able to play through it. So yeah. hopefully he has a big season because I expected him last year to have a really big yeah. season. Yeah, it's kind of my gut feeling, similar to what you thought last year. So we'll see. We'll see Tyson Troy. In that same vein, Adore asks – They've been talking about rotating players now that Helton thinks we have depth. Glancy has acknowledged his plans has Callaway. Will the O-line get more non-starter significant playing time? Well, we've seen this some. I mean, you saw when Toa went down, Clayton Bradley and Austin Jackson rotated there. You saw some rotation with Andrew Voorhees previously. I mean, there's been some rotation. You saw some rotation at that right tackle spot with uh, – I think Clayton Bradley and, and Chuma Doga at the beginning of the season with Chuma not fully healthy. So you've seen some. It's not something that's out of the realm, at least in that regard. Yeah, I'm just checking to see if we have. If you, we're on, we got a bunch of people on Periscope. So if you have any comments, you can put them on Periscope too, and we'll, uh, we'll. Uh, the boss man will monitor it. I'll monitor. It. Yeah, I just wanted to check online just to make sure because I, I have it on the iPad for the first time. So I wasn't sure if they wasn't showing comments, but <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, try it out. Hopefully, hopefully they're coming up there. Um, Nice. We have a question from Angel who says, parking info for Saturday? And that's definitely something that everyone needs to be aware of because that's going to be a mess. <laughs> it's going to be complicated and messy. Unless you have a parking pass that is designated for the Coliseum, you cannot park at the Coliseum. So you have to park on campus. Uh, campus parking is $25 for the games, so park on campus. You know, there's several lots around campus. Park there. Uh if you don't live in Redondo Beach, I would suggest taking a metro. Don't if take you, the metro. Yes. If you live near a metro <laughs> line, you should take the metro. Because yeah. especially, like, if you live in the valley, hop on the red line, take it down, seven the metro, yeah. take the expo. There are it's good spots simple. you can take the metro from. And there's spots that aren't that good for it. So it, It's going to be really crowded after the game, but it is going to be so much better getting there because I expect there to be a traffic jam around the entire yeah. campus. 
because one, it's an earlier game, so you're not going to have people getting there super early for tailgating and stuff. It's going to be more compacted. Everybody's going to get there between 11 and 1 or from 10 to 12. So it's going to be there's going to be traffic everywhere around campus. I highly suggest that you take Metro in that regard. But if you are going and you don't have a parking pass for the Coliseum, you park on campus. Now, there's only a couple pay uh, pay once you get their uh, parking lots on campus. Mo most of them are now uh, parking passes, too. So it's it's going to be complicated. Uh, I have tweeted the map that says what is permit and what is not permit. So nice. check that out. Um, but definitely know before you go. That's their big line, and it's true because you should know. Also, be aware that on your ticket, you have a specific gate that you have to enter into at the Coliseum. It's not like before. There's a lot of construction. Um, so just... Whatever you usually, whatever time you usually get to the Coliseum, add, add an hour on to that, just <laughs> yeah. to, be, to be sure, because get there early. just be safe. It's going to be different, and this is just the UNLV game, but it, yeah, so uh, we're, we're probably going to see a lot of tweets, a lot of message board posts about, I can't believe, blah, blah, blah. You, you know, you, you all know this is going to be, it's going to be difficult. Yeah. Get there at least an hour early, and if you get, and you, if you fly into campus and there's no problems, then hey, you got an extra hour to tailgate. Yeah. So, sure. take advantage. Take advantage. Uh, we have an interesting question from Adore who says, do you think it would be better if Coach Kenichi Udezi was on the sidelines versus in the booth? Now, this is an interesting question because I accidentally touched a nerve when I interviewed yes. Coach KU after the Ohio State game. I was just curious because he's a very personal coach. He likes to talk to his players and give them uh, advice immediately after a play happens. So I asked him, what, how do you feel being up in the booth? And he immediately was like, I hate it. I hate it so much, but that's something that they require of me, and I have to do what I'm required of. So it's interesting that I think he's still in the booth this season. I think in the scrimmages, he was up in the stands. Um, so it's interesting that he's up there. I think it might serve him better if he's down, the way he coaches, if he's down on the sideline. But what do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of his personality, and the fact that he would come out and say it. And there's, there's been other questions, too, because you had uh, back when, like, Tyson Helton and T. Martin, they were both up in the booth, and, like, you would see Sam Donald on the sidelines kind of like this or whatever, like no talking to nobody. But that's, you know, part of that's his personality too. Watch what's going on, the interaction with JT Daniels. Uh, my understanding is that, you know, Brian Ellis is going to be up in the press box too, but maybe that changes. And the press boxes are going to be temporary things that we're going to be in also. So that's all going to be different. They'll have, he'll have a, Kenichi, if he's up there, he'll have a different view because he's going to be like at row 45 instead of up in the row 90s or whatever. So, uh, I mean, that's just coaching philosophy, and it's got to come from the head coach on down. But if a, if assistant coach was coming to me and saying, hey, I'd rather be on the field, he's a fiery defensive line guy, I mean, just logically it makes sense to me. Yeah, let him go down and, and slap his guys in the head and stuff like that. <laughs> See, the, pro the part of the issue is that Clancy likes to be on the field. Like, most coordinators prefer being up in the box so they can see everything. Clancy feels that he can see everything from the field. So that changes the dynamic there. I think part of the reason is that Clancy really likes – KU's knowledge of seeing the whole defense yeah. and stuff. So I think that plays into it because who else are you going to put up there? Because your other defensive coaches are Johnny Nance, who's also a fiery guy, who's really a motivator on the sideline, and Ronnie Bradford, who likes to talk with his DBs and stuff and talk technique on the sideline. So if you're moving somebody up there, do you, you trust one of those other guys to be able right. to see the whole defense and give you a better idea? Because KU, I've talked with him in the past about it. And I was, you know, I'm like, what do you – what are you seeing, you know, necessarily? And he, he, I don't even remember what the question was, but he's brought up, he's like, you know, I tell not even my own guys, but I say, hey, this guy needs to do this or whatever. He sees the whole defense, I think, with a better eye than maybe the other defense coaches would. Um, but I, you, it just depends on each right. guy. And, and maybe Clancy gets that feel from watching film when you're watching the bird's eye and who's pointing out, you know, what things. Uh, so I think that's part of it is that he trusts him, his – ability to see the entire defense rather than just his guys though I know KU he's such a hands-on guy yeah. you see him when the whole team's doing other special team stuff the defense alignment are over there working on hands drills working on hand placement doing different things like that so you know I'm sure he would obviously would love to be down there because of that too yeah if it's for the greater good if he if he's got some skill like shotgun saying then you know that makes sense it's like hey I'd rather be doing this but I'm better at something else that all the other guys aren't as good at I mean that that kind of makes sense. So you'd hope, you know, hopefully that's the reason behind it for whatever. But 
Uh, we have a question from Bob who says, do you guys think the penalty yards will be as bad as last year? We were penalized almost 1,000 yards in 2017. He says, miss the old uscfootball.com tailgates. Oh, yeah, the tailgates were, were fun. It's just so hard because we got to be there real early and, and get into the Coliseum. It's just, it's just really hard to do. We'll, we'll try to do some events. We're, all, we're doing an event tomorrow before the jock rally. So this is, this is Thursday we're recording this. Friday. Uh, from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. will be there. Former USC tight end and NFL tight end who just retired, Randall Telford, is going to come. Sean Cody, who you can hear on the radio uh, broadcast, uh, pre and post game, I think he's doing mm -hmm. uh, now. So he's going to show up. And Ben, um, yeah, uh, ben Malcolmson is going to come too. So he was a walk on at USC, uh, you know, been with Pete Carroll for forever. And he wrote a book recently called Walk On. Had him on the podcast uh, last week which is fun. So he's going to come too. So if you have his book, he's doing a book signing a little bit later on. And the jock rallies from five. So a lot going on on campus. And then during, I'm going to see Clay Hilton at lunch, if Pasadena Quarterbacks Club. If you're interested in that, you can go to lunch up there in Pasadena. So it's going to be a busy USA, USC day for me. Now I forgot what the question was. Oh, uh, <laughs> penalty yards. Penalty yards. Yeah. The USC good. hasn't left the Pac-12, so yes. There's going to be a lot of penalties. <laughs> USC has had been a heavily penalized team since the early Pete Carroll days as well. Uh, the question is, where are those penalty yards coming from? Is there from special teams again? I might, my head might explode. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. There's so many last year. That's, that's the big concern. Where, the, where are you losing yardage? And is it on big plays where you lose and yards are coming back? Those type of things. Those are the bigger issues. And what kind of penalties are you getting? If it's false starts and offsides and stuff that are, you know, mental things or 12 men on the field, those type of things. You know, Clay called them out last week because of their lack of communication when subbing in and out. And he's like, you're going to get a 12 men on the field. Or even worse, if you end up with eight people on an extra point. <laughs> Uh, so, <laughs> so we'll see where those penalties are coming. But like Ryan said, you're in the Pac-12. If you notice, you look at the rankings yeah. every year of the top teams that are penalized. Usually, there's like six or seven in the yeah. top ten that are, <laughs> are Pac-12 Pac teams. I, I'm get my guess is that they're going to clean up some of the stuff on special teams. There won't be as many, and those are big penalties a lot of times. Ten, you know. Um, and I think in the secondary too. I don't think you're going to see as many uh, there. So I think it, it'll it should be a little bit less. If they eliminate some of the big penalties they were given up from, uh, you know, the passing game and also on special teams, I think that can, that's a lot of yards. I think that you can help yourself quite a bit with that. So that's my gut. We, you know, we'll see what happens. But I think, I think it'll be a little bit better this year. Let's go to a question from Jared that I, I'm going to tack on to a little bit. He says, how many touchdowns does JT throw on Saturday? And my modified question is, how much do you let JT throw? How much do you just run it down their throats? Because... You know, he has a bad run defense. How much do you show of JT to the world? Yeah, I don't think he's going to, I mean, I don't think he's going to get like a four or five touchdown pass day. I think if I'd put the over under like one and a half. So I think over. you go over, all right. If you yeah. put it two and a half, I'd have concern. You think about it? Okay. I'd probably still go over. Okay. I think I'll get three. Think I'll get three? Three, three? Yeah. throwing touchdowns? Three throwing touchdowns, I, I three rushing touchdowns for the team. All right. I just don't think they're going to ask him to do a whole lot. And, you know, you might see Matt Fink or Jack Sears or something later in the game, too. Not because, you know, just... That's when you get one of the rushing touchdowns. 42-14 could easily be, and I cover the spread. Bam. It could, yeah. Six touchdowns. Uh, I think a lot of it's going to be you're feeling it out and feeling out what's going on. I don't think they're going to want to put him in a position that he's going to throw a pick or two and then feel bad about what's going on. Is there a Good risk... Point. And trying to, you know, oh, we're going to try to let, you know get him a touchdown pass. Yeah, you know, well, when he throws an interception, and now does he have is his confidence hurting going into Stanford? So I just think it's going to be kid gloves. They're not going to ask him to do a whole heck of a lot. And also, you're going to have a simplified offense if you can. You try not to show anything in that sure. first game as long as you can. And like it, like Keely said, their run defense is not very good. If you can just run it down their throats, then you do that. Yeah. Now also, he might run it down their throats and then throw the back shoulder to Amon or you know, a quick uh, slant to Michael Pittman or something. Yeah, six yards. You get, that's a com easy throw. It's a confident builder. You know, so I think those are the type of things you could see as well. Sean has an interesting question. He says, how does the change in university leadership affect the football team, or does it? I think, yeah, there's no real effect uh, right now. I actually just met with one of the people on campus about something on the academic side. And, there, you know, there was – there was some uncertainty uh, for a little while, but now you have uh, you know an interim president that everybody likes, also from the engineering school, 
Um, and you know they're they're doing the search, so I think they're trying to clean things up. I don't think there's really much of an impact on or any really on the football team. We would see uh, Max Nikias come to practice. He would talk to our Dan Weber every once in a while. You know, he'd come over and ask Dan. He'd watch your instant analysis, Keeley. He so um, he was a big fan of you guys. So you you'll have one less viewer, I guess. But I don't think there's a, I don't think it's going to impact anything very much. Yeah, as long as you have an interim, they usually are not making large wholesale changes. I think. Yeah. Once you get a permanent president, then possibly. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, Richard says, how is the kicking game coming? Cooking? Oh, the kicking. <laughs> Should be fine. I'm kind of hungry, baby. That's I mean, why you, I have, you return true. Chase McGrath. You return Damon Johnson, your long snapper. You return Reed Budrovich as your punter. So you have your three primary yeah. special teams. Michael Brown is back, so he can push some competition if Chase McGrath as Clay Helton said, you know, Chase McGrath was banged up late in the season. They had a decision between do we kick long field goals or we just go for it because I don't know if he has a leg right now because of an injury. So now you have a backup there. You have like 13 backups at the punter position. Chris Tilby, who's on scholarship, has a punt in a year and a half now, basically. So, you know, if something were to happen to Reed Budrovich, then you, know, you potentially could, you have some another scholarship player there. Yeah. Uh, so there, there are guys there. I don't think it's going to be – if you – and if you have someone who's not performing well, you have someone else that can push in front of them. So I, I think the special teams in the kicking game would be fine. Yeah, I'd feel more comfortable if they had a few more guys on scholarship for the special teams. <laughs> more but than five it, guys on scholarship, which is way too many? <laughs> no, they, 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 I think it's been good. Like, I think Reed's been doing well. I think, uh, you know, Butterich punting. I think, um, the, you know, kicker. I, they, I think it's been, it's been fine. I don't think there's anything to be super concerned about. The more concerning thing is going to be, can they eliminate the yard, you know, the, the return games, the cover, the cover teams, and things like that. I think the kickers, putters should be fine. James has a question. Uh, why did they put Alman Ross St. Brown as a backup on the outside instead of a, on the slot where he's naturally better? Isn't he a little short to play outside against the tall CBs? I don't think he's too short to play there. He's proved that he can do that. I think they want to show him all over the place. and um, he'll, He's going to be in the rotation. You're probably going to see him play a slot, too. I think, especially as the season wears on and you kind of see what he's able to do, I think you're going to see a lot of him uh, all over the place. So I wouldn't worry about, you see him on a depth chart, what he's going to say, he's not going to play. or he's not. He, he'll play the slot. He'll play you know, a lot of outside. So I think you're going to see, see him all over the place. I'm just looking up their current DBs are five foot ten, I believe, and are you specifically talking about you know five me? foot eleven? So yeah. you know me? Yeah. Okay. Jericho Flowers is probably their best defensive back. I think he's like five ten or five. He's five ten. The other guy's five yeah. eleven. So I mean, that's what I'm on. Rise five eleven. Even though USC list him at six one. He's not six one. So I went. I went through and updated all the roster, all the heights and weights, and it was it was amazing how quickly the guys from high school gained an inch. Almost every one of them. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's crazy. He's 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 really in good shape. Don't worry about him not being uh, tall enough or whatever. Just just watch how they use him. We're not sure how they're going to use him, but my guess is it's going to be. You're going to see a, a bunch of them out there. Your height doesn't matter that much on the outside. It, I mean, it's great for having jump balls and stuff. I mean, it's great to have height. It's great. No, don't take that away. But it's not – if you're smaller, it doesn't mean you can't play on the outside. I mean, you can go up and get the ball. You know, he does a really good job of high pointing the ball. It, it, and he also – but even more importantly is – he does all the small things that get him open yeah. so he doesn't need to go up and jump over somebody to be, get it. For example, the first – Long touchdown pass. I've mentioned it several times now, but the small little thing, he just took his arm and did just this enough to create that much separation as the ball was arriving. Now, some guys don't know when to do this. Some guys don't know to do this. Some guys do it too much, and you send your arm, you get a penalty. He did it just enough, creates a separation. He makes a catch on the outside, and all of a sudden, JT's off to the races with a 10 for 12 day for four touchdowns. He catches three of them in that first scrimmage. So he does all those things, and he's such a great route runner that oftentimes there's not somebody there. Right. Usually the only time there's somebody there is on you know just the straight go patterns and stuff where it's not about his technique, it's about you know just being an athlete. And watch him catch the ball. I mean he's got really strong hands. He can just he'll put it out there and catch it away from his body. He's not there's nothing like he's a really well put together wide receiver, as Shotgun said many times. And you don't need I mean you got Tyler Vaughn who's a you know rebounder guy that can get up and you got a big Michael Pittman those guys you can throw the ball up to more. I don't really need to do that with Amon Ross St. Brown. He can go catch those things, but that's not necessarily his game. And just because he's listed on the outside doesn't mean he won't play the inside as yeah. well. 
The same thing with Tyler Vons and Michael Pittman. You know, they do things when they, when they only have two receivers in. They'll put two guys on one side, so one of those guys is actually in the slot. So, you know, they, I think looking at the, the PFF stats, I, I think I remember seeing, uh, you know, it was just a list of some of the top wide receivers, and USC's outside receivers play a lot in the slot technically. So uh, it's, he's going to get moved around, and Clay's talked about that previously. They love moving around Robert Woods. They love moving around Marquise Lee and Nelson Aguilar, Juju as well, because you don't want them, you know, you don't want a team to just be able to bracket a guy and say, okay, we're going to have the DB here. We're going to put a safety over top the entire time because your guy's that good. So we're just going to take him away and force you to beat somebody else. So for example, when Calvin Johnson was at Georgia Tech, do you remember anybody else on that Georgia Tech team? <laughs> no, because there was nobody. Um, and he made, I think Joey Hamilton might have been the quarterback at that time, who was actually a Heisman finalist. Why? Because he could run, but also because he could just throw it up to Calvin Johnson. Now, if a team takes away a guy like that with two defenders or even three defenders, now what are you going to do? It's not the same at USC. they got multiple guys, and also they move them around so that the teams can't do that. I think they're gonna, not going to be a lot of focus on Brown early, and he might make some big plays because there's focus other plays. But we'll see. We will see. A quick question from Martin who says, would Uber or Lyft be a good suggestion to get to the Coliseum? The problem with that becomes when you try to leave, Everyone else is trying to get an Uber. Yeah. So you might have like large surge pricing, or you just might not get one. Or just go somewhere to eat afterwards. Walk to yeah. somewhere, a yeah. cheesesteak place that Ryan loves, or Chick fil A, or whatever. Now, the crowds might be a little bit, or if you walk a little bit farther, or if you just take the train after that and take it one or two spots and, you know, go yeah. somewhere. It's like a buck 75 or something. You could take the train somewhere. Take an actual train, not the bus. Take a train. Yeah, you could take the expo line. Three spot stops, I think it is, and you're right across from Staples Center and LA Live. You can go eat there or something, yeah. and then you take an Uber after that. Yeah, you can Uber, whatever, yeah. Um, let's go to a question from Chris, who says, how do you see the distribution of touches between RBs going this weekend? Hi, Chris. Um, <laughs> well, I think uh, I think you're going to see Akacedric Ware first. I think he's going to be the guy that ends up starting. Um, I think you're going to see a steady diet, though, of all three of those guys. Will it be by series? Will it be situational? It's hard to say. We're not really sure uh, how that's going to work out. But I think it'll be more of a, like if I had to guess, like maybe Ware gets like 12 to 15 carries in this game and Carr gets maybe like 9 or 10, but he'll, he'll be a little bit more in the passing game and vibe, maybe, you know, maybe in the like 7, 8 range, something like that. We'll see. I mean, they, it depends on how the game kind of plays out. But I think you're going to see... Ware will probably kind of get the most with, with Carr there, but Vi's really good too, and he's going to have to get you know get a little something. And you know maybe if they they end up running the ball like eighty times on these guys, then there'll, there'll be more than that. But I'm I'm kind of guessing it it won't they won't get that many plays, and it's just going to be like this kind of get through this game, pound them down a little bit, and then move on. Is there going to be ten to twelve? 10 to 15 touches probably for all three of them, somewhere in there, or 8 to 15, somewhere in there. It's going to be pretty evenly distributed. Marquis Stepp will not play, Clay Helton said. He just came off concussion protocol. He uh, was cleared yesterday, but he will not play on Saturday. So it's going to be three guys, and you're going to see those guys mixing around. I would bet you'd even see probably Ben Easington at the end of the game. Yeah, I was going to say, if you see 37 in, then that's probably a good sign for USC because yep. you're going to walk on. I would like to make a correction. There's a little discrepancy in years because I'm terrible with years. Joe, Joe Hamilton was in 2000 with Georgia Tech. It was Reggie Ball who was the quarterback oh, Reggie at Ball, Georgia yeah. Tech at the time. He was like an athletic dude, right? I think athletic dude, yeah. just throw it up, though. Yeah. Um, I can very much see USC just handing the ball off to Sed the first drive, maybe throw like once or twice. Yeah. But just really boring vanilla, drive the ball down, one yard rush from touchdown from Sed. Kind of boring and getting the nerves out for JT. Yeah, so. we we were asked about that on the podcast, like who's going to score the first. To give us your, your answers in the Facebook comments right now. Who do you think will score the first touchdown this I like season? It. Yeah, we've been asking everyone this, and I, we want to hear your answers. Who's going to score the first touchdown? Who's, You're going to get crazy and say touchdown? something. JT Daniels. Not throw. Who we'll score? <laughs> That's like, what he said. We'll be in the end zone. Yeah. I think said where. Tweet me if it happens. Yeah, yeah I was going to pick. <laughs> Uh, where uh, well, I think Vons is a good, but I went with uh, Tyler Petit, I think, on the uh, the podcast. Maybe a little dump off, you know, they get down there close in a little tight end screen or something. I don't know. I'm telling you, that first drive is going to be boring. It's going to be boring. Yeah. It's going to be just runs. No, where was my first thought? But you picked it already, so I'm <laughs> going to go somewhere else. Yeah. Stephen Carr could be it. Certainly. Yeah. Could. If it's really boring, that means they're switching out running backs because they're going to run it seven, eight, nine times. 
And then even or it might one, just be one big play, fifty-two yard run. It might be like yeah. a St. Brown thing too, where like they're covering all the other guys, and Brown just ends up being like wide open, and they just you know, he hits and makes a huge play. So, what maybe it wasn't the intent, but he he makes something happen. I like your thinking, Gerald. Defense, Iman Marshall pick six. I think I actually said that. You did yeah, say yeah. that. That's what he said. Um, When's the last time he had a pick six? Never. He's never had one. So I don't know. Like that, to, to say the first. Yeah. You know. He got tackled by Josh Rosen, I think, kept him from a oh, six his yeah. US, year. UCLA seems to be the game for Elon to get those interceptions. We have uh, a lot of people watching on Periscope, but I don't think there's been. Oh, there are some. It's not showing up on here. Yeah. Uh, so you want me, you know, I can, I, can I do one more question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Greg says, who do you think will lead USC in rushing this year? Uh, Stephen Carr. I think by the end of the year, he'll get more carries and stuff. He'll get more. Well, that's that's tough because some of his touches are going to come receiving more total yards for sure. Um, but rushing yards, I think just his his big play ability makes him that more gives him that much more opportunity to get those big yards. So I think he will. But I think if you can get 600 to 800 yards out of other guys, I, I think you know you get one of those guys behind him. And the question becomes who gets injured, you know. How serious are the injuries? Right. Running backs never make it through their careers uninjured, so we'll see. I'd go with Ware, but yeah, it's going to depend a lot about injuries. I think Carr yeah. might have more yards from scrimmage, but I'll go Ware. We yeah. either, Keeley. My gut says Ware. All right. I nice. Think. We have a periscope on USC Fred. I'm sorry, it's not for what I put this here so I could read the periscopes easier. Now I got to look to the side, but uh, for whatever reason, but USC Fred said, with a talk about being a make or break year for our offensive line coach. Uh, Callaway can say the same be the said for John Baxter, so the special teams coordinator. Yes, I think so. I mean, if 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 it is a make or break for Neil Callaway, then yes, also John Baxter. Right. The, the the biggest thing with those two guys is you know how much Clay Helton really likes them. Obviously, the familial connection with uh, Neil Callaway. You know, he coached with his father and stuff, and he's basically like an uncle. But also, he really uh, Clay Helton really looks up to John Baxter. Not only the academic plan and stuff, but you know, it just he was here when Clay was brought in by Lane Kiffin, and I think he really looks up to him as a veteran coach. So, I think things have to go really bad for those guys to get fired. Do you have yeah. more periscope, or do you want to? Oh, I, I have a question oh. loaded, but go ahead, go ahead. Load okay, it up, yeah. uh, let's go to uh, Jeriel. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that wrong. I'm sorry. He says, "Where do you think the depth chart is wrong if we are talking either mid-season or end of season? Who makes a push and who could lose their spot?" Ooh, interesting Good question, Jeriel. Um, I mean, I think at safety, you could see, you know, there that was highly contested. I mean, that could there could be some movement there. I think on the defensive line, you're going to see all those guys sort of uh, rotate in. So I don't think there would be that much um, of a difference. I mean, maybe, like, if a Port Augustine isn't healthy, who would we see? Uh, Hunter Eccles, I think, pushes his way up there, even possibly at the same spot, depending on, you know, how well he holds the edge and do, does those things on that side. Who was that? W Fala Nico was getting some first team. Was he getting no. Oh, it was, uh, it was Eccles. I, yeah. Eccles. Get the 31-41 um, screwed up. Yeah. And then where, where does Jordan Iacefa end up? Because you, you move him around. Uh, I Ask Cam Smith about it, and he said just it makes you feel more comfortable because you know if, if someone's not playing well or someone gets injured, you can move Jordan ISF there because he knows all four of the spots. So I, I think with the linebackers, I think there can be some movement there potentially. Um, at the middle is probably not locked up unless you get injuries because you have two veteran guys there, Richard Jr. and John Houston and a senior and Cam Smith. So besides that, and then the offensive line, I think that's – you know, a question mark, I think, with Elijah Vera Tucker has played really well. If he gets some opportunities and proves himself in games, he could earn extra opportunities there. It could be like replacing someone with an injury and not coming back. Yeah. Uh, what was it, like uh, Voorhees last year? I mean, I think there's some opportunities there, too. Yeah. All, that's the other thing. Running backs and offensive line, you know there's going to be injuries, unfortunately. Um, so yeah. who gets injured there? And who steps up and takes a spot? Yeah. I think for running backs, though, like they'll all still – if a guy gets injured – Someone will get an opportunity, but they'll probably come back and still play. Yeah. you know. But. I mean, I think Stephen Carr ends up being the starter by the end of the season. But interesting. I think Alvin Rob becomes a starter, uh, either Ooh. mid or end. Okay. I think that's a novel. Um, I think. But hearing... like, at, like as a slot starter or a, you mean like take up Pittman He's not or Vaughn? Not taking Pittman or Vaughn. No, spot. yeah, I think he, okay. I think he replaces Bayless at some point. All right. Um, I think that Trayvon Sydney's gonna play pretty well too. We'll see. So they, they got a lot of a lot something. of weapons. If Daniel Amore Bebe ever gets healthy. Yeah. That's a big... Josh edge. Follow, you know. I know. Hamstring. And the well, new, the new H-back spot. The F. Or the F? What is it? Lex tight end. Yeah. So, 
Um, Are they going to list like 13 or 14 guys as starters for the, for the beginning of the season? Yeah, probably. Malik I, Gordon was a starter. There was 12 starters every game last year. Or there would, just Malik Gordon was always the starter. Like you never actually start in your base defense that you say. Ruben Peters, like he wouldn't start. Yeah, yeah, fullback. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, what are they going to do for that fullback spot? Are they going to go put that on the graphic this year? We'll still put Ruben there just for memory's yeah. sake. Yeah, he's always playing linebacker. Like put him over there. I also think after hearing Clancy talk about Greg Johnson yesterday, I feel like Greg will eventually take that corner spot. Yeah. He's already starting. I know, but... Take it. I well, okay, sure. I mean, meaning I don't think they'll be listed as or anymore. So you're saying he's going to lock it up? we got a bunch of Periscopes people are saying, I'm on Ross St. Brown will score, Vales Jones. Uh, Derek agrees with me. <laughs> we had a couple of Vales Jones. Uh, so people are saying great show. So thanks, thanks for the pair. Gerald says he wants a Trojan Cup if Elon Marshall gets picked six, since he did predict it on our show. I, I predicted it first though. So is that the <laughs> oh yeah, no, we'll get you. So we'll get you one of these from our, our buddy Blink. I actually ran into saw Gary at a happy hour thing. He does a great job with the uh, with the Bling wares. Bob Max had a forty six yarder to St. Brown. So we'll see. A lot of a lot of potential. Yeah, I think if St. Brown scores, it's like a long one. Like it's like a maybe unexpected, just like they come up with a huge play. His yeah. first touchdown in the scrimmage was a seven yard back shoulder. Yeah. I just don't think he would be necessarily in at that yeah. juncture of the game in yeah. a game game. But he could be in the middle of the field and like they're double covering the other guys and then and JT loves to look for Safety him. Safety blanket. He, yeah. You never know. He might just find him. Um, Eric says, will JT be given the green light to adjust plays at the line of scrimmage and audible out? That's a big question. Yeah, I don't think so, um, especially yeah, early on. Not this year. I don't think I mean, Sam Darnold like, really yeah, had a lot like, of that. Yeah, like you didn't have Sam Darnold doing that. Um, I mean, the, the RPO stuff, there'll be some wiggle room, but as far as like getting the line going, okay, we're getting out of this, we're going to do, like, I, yeah, I don't think, you know, he's not Peyton Manning it up there. Omaha. Like, yeah, Omaha. <laughs> um, Modern day. Modern day. Yeah. Is that is that a call now? Yeah, he's just gonna throw it on mine. <laughs> <laughs> but this seems like a pretty obvious tip. Uh, <laughs> Kobe says, "Would you start Dorton over Tufele?" Yes. Yeah, that's fine with that. But they'll both play. Tufele is too good not to be on the field. So just because we didn't talk a ton about, I was about Malik Dorton or John Houston doesn't mean they didn't have a good fall camp. Right, yeah. They didn't play as much as some of the other guys. For some, uh, some of the guys, they rotated in those younger guys they wanted to because they know the upside of a guy like Jay Tufele. They want to continue to get him. Malik Dorton knows the defense. He knows what he's doing. He's been in that defense for three years. He's gonna be fine. He'll be the starter. You know, maybe eventually Jake Tavella takes over that spot. We'll see. But I, like Ryan said, they're going to rotate those defense yeah. linemen. Cl Clancy even talked about it yesterday that he knows there's going to be some rotation up front with those guys. So don't there's fret, the, guys. Yeah, they'll be the most rotation on the line. And you want a guy like uh, Dorton in there to to be a leader. Be, you know, he's a veteran guy. He's going to help a lot of those young players. they got some really good, talented, athletic, big dudes up there. And so I think Dorton's going to lead them through that. So, yeah, he, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. We have a question from Gary. Gary already asked this earlier, and I missed it. Sorry, Gary. Uh, he says he's excited about the team's depth, depth, but is there any areas of concern where an injury or two can damper things? Quarterback. <laughs> Quarterback. <laughs> yes. Um, safety. Safety. That second safety position. Yeah. As far as now, you have very inexperienced guys replacing. With well, Ross gone, I think that hurts. That spot. The depth. Yeah, there. definitely. I, it's, it's a very confusing situation um, as far as what we know on the surface. It's, if he's going to stay and graduate and transfer after this year, why not just play and graduate and transfer after this year? But that's just on the surface. We don't know everything behind the scenes. You also have, you know, with safeties, you're always concerned about the potential of a targeting call, too. Because you're coming in on a play, a guy like Bubba Bolton is a big hitter. Yep. Uh, you know, if, if they get called for something and you know how fickle those calls are, if you watch the Pac-12. Now, USC was not affected much by these calls last year, but if you watch any of the other Pac-12 games, you'd be like, it's not a targeting. How is that a target? That guy's ejected. J done from the game. If it's in the second half, he's done for the first half of the next game. So those could be a concern. So then Isaiah Polamau is getting in the game. Uh, how how quickly can Talanoa Hufunga catch up? Can he you know be a potential guy in there? Does C.J. Pollard need to play? So yes, at safety, I think there are concerns there at that spot. At the middle linebacker spot, if Cam Smith were to go down, you can move Jordan Isefa. Is it the same? Not quite. No. Uh, so yeah. you know that would be a concern as well. I, I think you know still at cornerback. I'm not sold on those other guys behind those freshmen. 
Elijah Griffin has got a lot of praise from the coaching staff and stuff. Elijah Griffin has also given up a lot of touchdowns in practice and stuff. He is a very boom or bust yeah. guy right now. Uh, they've got to get him a little bit more consistent with him. And an ITS is still coming along, so I think a cornerback also there. Cool. We had, a, we had one real quick um, from Trojan Grad 91. What other, what other true freshmen will make a big impact this year besides Daniels and St. Brown? I think that's your... I think that's, it's like those two will make an impact. Kanai Monga. He could. Yeah. Could get six yeah. sacks off the edge. Um, he's, he's great yeah, coming like off the edge. Yeah, like if Porter's not you know, healthy and he comes in a little or bit more. Or just if you sub in more because he's a guy that gets the quarterback. Yeah. That's what he does well. Um, and then you know, potentially if there's an injury or like we just talked about, Talanoa, you know, we think he's talented enough that he could potentially get in there and make an impact too. Yeah. Elijah Griffin maybe at some point. I don't know. Does like, redshirt freshman count? He said true freshman oh, okay. on the question. Never mind. Yeah. So we have to go by the letter of the law. By the letter of the law. Yes. Um, we should probably wrap it up pretty soon, right? Pretty much. We're over our time limit. Uh, Kobe says, who fulfills their All-American aspirations this year? Will we see any freshman All-Americans? Uh, I think uh, Iman Marshall is an All-American. Uh, and I think Cameron Smith gets – I think he got some second or third team last year. I think yeah. he could be easily – Chuma uh, Doga maybe? Maybe. Potential. It's always hard to it's hard to evaluate offensive linemen, but if he gets some buzz, it's hard to evaluate them, and then it's even harder for them to actually pick because yes. no one really knows what they're watching with offensive linemen. The people that are voting for a lot of the All American stuff are like, oh, I, well, yeah, I heard about uh, that guy before the season." Now, if they get some clips like you know the guys at Notre Dame did last year, where you're just destroying the guy from Georgia, I'm trying I'm blanking on the name of the guard. I'm thinking McGlinchey is the tackle, but. Uh, the guard that went in the first round when he yeah. just destroyed oh. the guy Top picking up pick, yeah. picking up two guys on a blitz. You do that and it goes kind of viral, and that builds your stature a little bit more. And then people start talking to you. Now, granted, he's a terrific offensive lineman. Quentin Nelson is the name. Um, yeah. So Very good. he obviously deserved his. But a lot of times it's just the buzz because people don't really know what they're watching and they don't know they don't get to watch a ton of games around the entire country if you're voting on the AP All American or whatever it may be. So. Sometimes it's, it's a lot more about the buzz than actually the play. And the right answer is Tyler Vaughn, so that's the... <laughs> um, before we wrap it up, shall we announce what we're doing on Sundays? Uh, yeah, so we're going to do a Sunday show, Tunnel Vision. So Ta-da. Tunnel Vision Sundays. We're still working on the background and some, some intro music. We're, you know, we're working on things. We're just kind of building this up a little bit. we got to get our YouTube thing uh, yeah, we straightened that out. But Talk to them again. We're on two... We're, we're, Bycasting or whatever. We're simulcasting. Um, yeah, so we're going to do it on Sunday evenings. What we've decided is to do it after Clayton's conference call, which is at 6 p.m. Um, we're not exactly sure on the time. So if you want to, this is always the worst asking. So don't tell us, like, hey, I want you to do a show about water polo. This is only saying. Hey, water polo's fun. Yeah, it's fine. But we're, <laughs> this is not opening it up for suggestions for everything about the show. Really just. Sunday evenings, we could do around 7 p.m., which is sort of like right after the conference call. We could do it then. Might be halftime of the Sunday night football game. Or we could wait till like 8, 8.30 towards, towards the end of the game when it's like they've been blots and stuff anyway. Would you rather see that? Would you rather see like a 7 p.m. or 8 or 8.30 p.m. start? I know you guys are all, this is a Thursday at noon crew, so maybe it's <laughs> not the same people as Sunday night. But we're going to do two tunnel visions, this one and then... The Sunday one will be a little bit more post game after the show. Yeah. Analysis. Yeah. That um, stuff. So let us Put know. Put comments in right now. I'm reading them. Or let us know what the <laughs> comments required. you think. Don't tell me that you would like to change the camera. Like we're, this isn't the, all. This is not up for debate. This is just about the, the Sunday evening stuff. What time? Yeah. What time would you like to see it? Shaka, what time do you want to see it? <laughs> Sooner the better. We were thinking about doing it earlier on the Sunday, but then you're going to do it before the conference call. There could be some big news and stuff coming out of that, so it probably makes sense to do it after the conference Ryan, call. Ryan, are you watching Periscope if people are telling you? Oh, uh, let's see. <laughs> John, we have 8.30. We have one 8.30. John says, I vote for halftime Sunday night game. Around 7 o'clock, I think, might be the... So, actually, just give us, if you want, 7 or 8.30. That's really the two options. Yeah, yeah. John makes a good point. He says, us East Coasters need our beauty sleep. Uh... Okay, John. That's it's true. Also, we'll have it up in the morning. So if you're, you know, if you're not able to stay up late on Sunday night, we'll have it posted so you can yeah. watch. Yeah, we but watch you don't the, get the live experience. The live sure. experience is fine because it might be screwing things up. You don't really know. Like some feeds not working, but we're, yeah, we're getting a lot of live uh, viewers now. Now the season's coming around, um, and we'll try to do some live stuff on these different platforms 
uh, on Saturday too, like pre post game, maybe some halftime stuff. Sometimes I'll put the band, I'll, I'll do it from the press box, show the band, uh, things like that. So we'll have you guys covered. Yeah. But that's the big announcement. We're going to be doing a Thursday show and also a Sunday evening show. So uh, if you guys are able to join us, we'd love to have you again. Love your comments, your questions, everything. And we'll be talking on Thursdays. We'll be talking a little bit more about the matchups coming up and what we've seen from the practice week. On th on Sundays, we'll be doing a recap more of the game. Uh, obviously, we can't do it right after the game. We have a lot of other stuff, instant analysis, all the other stuff, our interviews. We're working on that. But then Sunday nights, we will be kind of recapping after what Clay Helton's conference call. So we'll have the latest on the injuries. We'll have the latest on you know any concerns there from the last game and going forward. So we'll have it there. So 7 or 8.30, let us know there. Seven uh, seems to be what the East Coast people want, for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's probably true if you want to get some of the East Coast people in. And uh, we do appreciate, like, this is kind of a unique thing. You don't see a lot of people doing stuff like this because it's, I mean, it's not that easy to set this stuff <laughs> up. So that's probably why you don't see a lot of it. But if you do have any other feedback, I mean, certainly let us know. Uh, don't forget tomorrow, um, you know, lots of USC stuff going on the day before the game. But we will have our meet and greet between 3 and 5 p.m., Next to, so between the John McKay Center, which is the new uh, athletic building, and Heritage Hall, that's where they do the jock rally. So all, if you don't know the jock rally at 5 o'clock, all the players come out, the band, the song girls, everyone's is just kind of a celebration. So we'll be there for a couple hours early, giving away those cool Trader Joe's bags. I don't have one with me, but uh, I think probably one in the other room. They're awesome USC-branded Trader Joe's bags. So we're going to give away hundreds of those things, and uh, it should be a lot of fun. So come on out and say hello. Uh, you can chat with all of us and some former players and things like that. So it should be a lot of fun. Very cool. I mean, any any final thoughts before we wrap it up? 42-14. Oh, we're doing game predictions. I hate game predictions. Uh, Where's Tesha Troy to call me out? <laughs> it's a tradition. I think it's more of like a 35-14 kind of thing. You don't think they cover? I don't think they cover this one. Could really? be wrong. Uh, 45 to 10. Is that oh. a football score? 35 yep. points. Yeah. So that's, uh, so you Cover. guys think they cover. I think they do not. We'll see. I don't know. I just Who's drew right? a number Is it video. the millennials or is it the old guy? Who's right? We don't, we'll old is out. correct. Is Shaka a millennial? <laughs> I don't even know what I am. Are you a millennial? I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> anyway. All right. That's going to wrap it up for this week's episode of Tunnel Vision. We will see you guys on Sunday after some real football has been played, and that's going to be exciting to talk about. Uh, but we'll see you guys then. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you later. See you guys. Thanks.